30 years ago, I walked into Disneyland for the first time. I hated it. <laughs> Three decades later, I teach a college course. I give professional presentations. I write books on my favorite place anywhere in the world, Disneyland. What changed? Well, not the park. What I hated about Disneyland in August 1988 is that the park was too hot. The park was too crowded. We waited more than three hours for our first Disneyland ride. In 2017, if you go to Disneyland in August, why the park will still be too hot, too crowded, and yes, we can still wait more than three hours for our favorite Disneyland attractions. No, it's not the park that changed. You see, when I first walked into Disneyland, I knew nothing about Walt Disney and nothing about the Magic Kingdom. Walt Disney was the hero in his story. He built Disneyland for the purpose of telling stories, stories that are challenging you, challenging you to go out and live your own great story. And that's why I'm here this morning. Yes, we're going to talk about Walt Disney and Disneyland, but more importantly, I am going to challenge you to step up to take the lead, to be the hero in what you do each and every day. Let's get started. Right now, you are looking at Walt Disney's first studio, Laughagram Studio in Kansas City, Missouri. Here, Walt worked with a local dentist creating animation advertisements teaching children how to brush their teeth. But after only 18 months, Laughagram Studio and Walt Disney are bankrupt. And it is that bankruptcy, that financial failure that compelled him to California. Walt boarded a train. He boarded a train with $40, a single suitcase, and a one-way ticket. Joined forces with his older brother Roy in Los Angeles and together founded the Disney Brothers studio that today is the largest entertainment company anywhere in the world. What if? What if Walt Disney never goes bankrupt? What if Laughagram Studio is a success? Then maybe Walt spends the rest of his life in Kansas City and the rest of his career only ever working with a local dentist. I want you to imagine this moment, you are Walt Disney. It's 1923. You are 21 years old, already bankrupt, already financially ruined. You have a decision to make. You can stay in Kansas City. You can stay in Kansas City where it is safe, where it is comfortable, where you have friends, where you have family, and where you can give up. Or you can go all in. You can board the train. You can come to California. You can risk it all to be a hero in Hollywood. $40, a single suitcase, and a one-way ticket. What will you decide? You see, my friends, our, our story and our success hinge not on your situation or your circumstances. Our story and our success hinge on the decisions and choices that you make each and every day, every morning you have the opportunity to go all in. Every morning you have the opportunity to board the train. Where are you as a travel agency this morning? Where do you want to be? What train must you board to get there? Are you willing to go the extra mile to risk it all? $40, a single suitcase, and a one-way ticket. Risk it all for your customers, for your clients, for your families who are willing to do business with you and you alone because you are their hero. Well, now that Walt is in California, 
He will create his first successful cartoon character. You all know him by the name of? Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And by 1928, Oswald is so successful, Walt will board another train. He is headed to New York City. He wants to sit down with his distributor, Universal. He is looking for a bigger and better contract. But in that meeting, Walt and his wife, Lily, they will learn that when they signed the distribution deal, they had signed away the rights to Oswald as well. And while Walt and Lily were busy in New York City, Universal was busy in Southern California hiring away the very animators who had helped make Oswald so successful. Walt walked out of that meeting not with a bigger and better contract. He walked out with nothing. He boards the train west. He is staring bankruptcy in the face all over again. And on that train ride home, he remembered a little character who had kept him company during his darkest days in Kansas City pulled out a pad of paper, sketched out the first story, showed it to his wife, Lily, and said, Honey, what do you think of this guy? Lily looked at him and said, Why, Walt, he's cute. What are you going to name him? Walt said, Well, I'm, I'm thinking of naming him Mortimer. <laughs> and Lily said, Oh, no, Walt, that name is much too heavy. Why don't we go with Mickey instead? And it was in that moment, that moment of desperation that the world's most popular and profitable cartoon character was born. What if? What if Walt never loses Oswald the not-so-lucky rabbit? Then he never has a need for Mickey Mouse. Walt once said that it all started with a mouse, a mouse born out of desperation. You see, my friends, the difficulty that Walt faced in 1923 wasn't going bankrupt and the difficulty that he faced in 1928 wasn't losing Oswald the not so lucky rabbit the difficulty Walt Disney faced is the same challenge you and I face each and every day not moving forward I want you to imagine this morning that we are actually at Disneyland how many of you have a favorite Disneyland ride. We love those attractions. Space Mountain, It's a Small World, Pirates of the Caribbean. I want to take a moment this morning and share with you my favorite Disneyland attraction. And it's not nearly as thrilling as, say, Space Mountain, or as charming as It's a Small World, or as historic as Pirates of the Caribbean. Because my favorite attraction in all of Disneyland is a mere park bench. <laughs> and even though Walt built Disneyland to be a park, a place where we can sit and remember yesterday and dream, dream of that great, big, beautiful tomorrow, even though he built Disneyland to be a park, this is the only park bench in all of Disneyland you cannot actually sit on. Every attraction tells a story. Here is the story behind this park bench. In the 1940s, Walt Disney is a Hollywood movie mogul, a household name, but more importantly, he is the father to two young girls, Diane and Sharon. Every Saturday afternoon was Daddy's Day. Walt would take off with those young girls in Southern California. They'd go to the beach, they'd go to the mountains, they'd go to the museum, but far and away their favorite place to go was this little merry-go-round in nearby Griffith Park. Moms and Dads, grandmas, grandpas, you already know this. When you put a small child on a merry-go-round, do they ever want to ride it just once? No, they want to ride it again and again and again. And one Saturday afternoon, while Diane and Sharon are spinning on their merry-go-round, Walt Disney is sitting on this bench. He has an idea, a crazy thought. Walt Disney begins to dream there should be a place, a place where parents and children can have fun together. And so it was in that moment on this bench that the dream of Disneyland was born. But it's not just Walt, is it? You have ideas about how to be a better agent. You have 
crazy thoughts about how to take your company to the next level, you dream of doing things dramatically different. When my wife and I first moved to Southern California, we were excited. We were going to get to go to Disneyland. We were finally going to become local annual pass holders. And over the next six years, like Diane and Sharon on their merry-go-round, we would keep going back to the park again and again and again to the tune of well over 450 times. And somewhere along the way, I had that idea about doing my job better, that crazy thought about student success and student retention, a dream of taking success principles and marrying them to the story and the magic of the magic kingdom. There should be a class, a college course on the history of Disneyland. And right now, some of you are thinking, really? Seriously, a, a college course on the history of an amusement park? But others of you are thinking, wow, where was that class when I was in college? Walt Disney once said, all of our dreams can come true if you have the courage to pursue them. I had my dream, but what I lacked was what every hero needs. Courage. I didn't want to be the university professor who lost his job for pitching such a Mickey Mouse idea. <laughs> and so I did with my idea what you do with yours. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> but that doesn't mean our crazy thoughts let us go, does it? No, you see our our ideas are like the hitchhiking ghost in the haunted mansion. They will follow you home. They will distract you in the middle of the day. They will haunt you in the middle of the night. Or at least my idea did. And then everything changed on the afternoon of May 6, 2013. I was leaving the university campus, accelerating onto the freeway. And all of a sudden, I heard this horrific noise. I looked into my rearview mirror, saw my iPhone doing cartwheels down the shoulder. I raced back onto the freeway in the opposite direction, slowly made my way along that same shoulder. But before I ever found my iPhone, I first found something else that looked painfully familiar. Because in my distracted thinking about my crazy idea, oh, I had not only left my iPhone on the roof of the car, I had left my iPad as well. I stood there that day. I stood there that day with $1,000 in shattered electronics, and I knew, I knew I couldn't stand it anymore. I was done, done standing on the sidelines of my life, done only ever thinking and only ever talking, but never taking action on my idea. I was done watching cars pass by, knowing those aren't just cars. That is my life. I was done. It was past time. It was past time to go all in. $40, a single suitcase on a one-way ticket. This was my decision. There was never going to be another day that I didn't work on my crazy dream, a college course on the history of Disneyland. I made an immediate appointment with my boss, pitched my Mickey Mouse idea, and there I learned 30 years ago when he was a student at USC, he had worked as a cast member at Disneyland. He loved the idea. And so for the next year, because I stopped thinking and stopped talking and actually started doing, I got to work on my dream. Syllabus, curriculum, guest lecturers, field trips, textbooks, we had it all lined up. We had it all laid out. And the day that I gave the first lecture in my dream course, guess what? It was awesome. But let's hit the pause button for just a moment. How many of you love stories this morning? Of course you do. Stories are why we read books, go to the movies, and keep going back to Disneyland. We love stories, but every great story requires conflict. And as much as we love story, can we be honest with each other today? As much as we love story, oh, we want nothing to do with conflict. This morning, 
what stands between you and your idea for your agency, what stands between you and your crazy thoughts about taking your company to the next level, what stands between you and your crazy dream about doing things dramatically different. It's not a lack of ability. It's not a lack of time, nor is it a lack of money. It's an unwillingness, an unwillingness to embrace conflict. I know it's going to be difficult. That's why we need heroes. You're going to have to sharpen your sword. You're going to have to slay a few dragons along the way. Never forget. The bigger your dragon, the better your story. The bigger your dragon, the better your story. I'll give you an example. The day after I gave that first lecture, Dream Course, History of Disneyland, I faced the greatest conflict of my life. I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. The neurosurgeon said to me, Jeff, it is life-threatening. It's got to come out. Today is Friday. I need you here on Tuesday for brain surgery. Even if it is not cancerous, because of the invasiveness of the surgery, you will be out of work anywhere from six to eight weeks. Six to eight weeks means no class. Six to eight weeks means the history of Disneyland wiped from the schedule, never to be seen or heard from again. Six to eight weeks means my dream dies. And then I remembered, I'm all in. $40, single suitcase, one-way ticket. I looked the neurosurgeon in the eye and I said, sorry, doc, Tuesday isn't going to happen. And he wanted to know, well, Jeff, what are you doing that's so important you're willing to put off brain surgery and risk your life? And I said to him, well, I am a, I'm a university professor, and I have class this summer. And he wanted to know, well, Jeff, what class are you teaching that you're willing to put off brain surgery and risk your life? And when I said to him, history, history of well. Disneyland? Oh, I thought he was going to kill me before the tumor ever had a chance. But that's when I knew this is a passion. Why? I don't see the parks as an escape, my friends. I see them as an example. I don't see Disneyland as the place where dreams come true. I see it as the place that is showing you showing you how to make your own dreams come true. I'll give you an example. Walt built Disneyland again for the purpose of telling stories. And on opening day, the best stories that were told were by way of the original dark rides in Fantasyland. They're still there. Snow White, Scary Adventures, Peter Pan's Flight, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. And when our guests first experienced those attractions in 1955 and they rode Snow White, first and foremost, they're looking for Snow White. And when they rode Peter Pan, they were on the lookout for Peter Pan. And when they rode Mr. Toad, they were looking for Mr. Toad. Walt Disney had a different vision, however. He wanted to immerse you in the story. He wanted you to have the opportunity to take the lead and be the hero. There was no Snow White. You are Snow White. There was no Peter Pan because you are Peter Pan. There was no Mr. Toad. You get to be Mr. Toad. How cool is that? And we didn't get it. For 30 years, guests lined up at City Hall on Main Street, and they complained. I just wrote Snow White. Did you know she's not there? I just rode Peter Pan three times in a row. You know how long that ride is. He is nowhere to be found. Where is Mr. Toad? And so in 1983, when they renovated Fantasyland, they put the heroes, the lead characters, back into those stories and back into those attractions, which is great for Fantasyland, but does nothing for you and your life and your clients and your customers and your business, I want to challenge you right now. Stop! Stop looking for a hero. Someone needs to do something, do it! Somebody needs to step up and take the lead. If not you, then who? And if not now, when? Every single time you have a client or customer challenge, 
It's not a problem. It's not a difficulty. It's not an obstacle. It is an opportunity. An opportunity for you to be the hero. The hero in their story and the hero in your own story. Another question for you. How many of you, as you do this home-based travel agency thing, you have folks, they don't believe this is a real business? <laughs> I mean, you say you have a job, but I mean, let's face it, you stay home all day, right? <laughs> you've got the doubters, you've got the naysayers, the people who don't believe in you and your ideas and your crazy thoughts and your dream and your agency. I need you to know this morning, you are not alone. When Walt Disney walked home on that Saturday afternoon, he said to his beloved wife, Lily, honey, we're going to build an amusement park. And she looked at him and said, oh, Walt, no. Why? Why would you want one of those? Those places are filthy. Today, Disneyland has the reputation as being the cleanest place on earth. A promise to his wife, Lily, who never believed in that crazy idea of a place called Disneyland. Now it's Monday. Walt sees his older brother, Roy, and he says to Roy, Roy, we're going to build an amusement park. And Roy looks at his little brother and says to him, Walt, oh, you have had some crazy ideas in your day. We are not building an amusement park. Well, lo and behold, in 1954, guess what Disney's doing? They're building an amusement park, an amusement park that nobody believes in except for Walt Disney himself. And then on Monday... July 18th, the day that the park opened to the general public, people just like you and me, Walt was really excited. The dream was real. And on that day, again, folks just like you and me were going to walk into the park for the first time. And maybe more importantly, they were going to spend money to get into Disneyland for the first time. The original budget for Walt's dream was three and a half to four million dollars. By the time they opened the gates, Walt had spent well over $17 million. But on that Monday morning, July 18th, 1955, <laughs> the very first person to spend the very first dollar to purchase that very first ticket into Disneyland was Walt's older brother, Roy. We are not building an amusement park. What are you not doing this morning? You know where you are. You know where you need to be. For your customers, for your clients, for your agency, and for your families. You see, my friends, in 1955, oh, we needed Walt Disney. We needed Walt Disney because we needed Disneyland. And in 2017, we need you. We need you with your ideas, your crazy thoughts. We need you with your dreams. We need you to be all in. $40, a single suitcase, and a one-way ticket. And when you make that kind of commitment, you will discover dreams really do come true. And not just for Walt Disney, and not only at Disneyland. Thank you.